think we're going to get started. Thank you for coming back in from the 80 degree weather overlooking the lake. Uh, this is going to be worth it. It's my great pleasure to introduce Jane Adams. Um, she actually self-introduced herself a little bit before. She's an artist, designer, turned computer scientist, uh, currently getting her PhD in data, at the Data Visualization Lab at uh, Northeastern University. And uh, she, I think she already told you that she holds um, bachelor's and master's degrees in fine arts from Champlain College. And um, if you got to hear her talk earlier today, I think you already know that she's a fantastic speaker, so this bodes well for this workshop as a teacher. I think she has this amazing ability to kind of seamlessly move between learning teaching and actually using these generative tools that she talked about earlier and she does this using art as a medium but she goes from no coding languages all the way up to these GANs, these generative ad adversarial net networks that she talked about earlier in Python languages. So with that said, her practice creatively blends the emergent media from these technologies with natural phenomena such as plants, fungi, weather, geology, basically to celebrate the beautiful relationship between science and the arts. I've actually had the pleasure of hearing her give a number of talks during the three years that she was a, I loved your title, data, a visual, a visualization, data, data visualization artist in residence. Um, for the three years that she did that for us at the Vermont Complex System Center at the University of Vermont. And so I find that whether she's presenting or teaching, she has this amazing ability to find a commonality with students of all ages, um, including those of us with white hair. So without further ado, no, you're not. <laughs> Beyond text to image, take it away, Jane. Uh, testing? Cool. Um, thank you so much, uh, Donna, for that incredible introduction. Uh, and thank you all for coming back inside on this beautiful day. I'm so sorry to keep you away from the sunshine. Um, it means a lot. And so I really hope uh, that this is a helpful workshop for you, regardless of whether um, you are, as I mentioned before, self-described, not a computer science person, uh, or you're an expert in AI and maybe you know more about it than I do. Um, but I really hope that this, this workshop kind of covers the gamut of tools that could be useful for anyone. Um, and I think it, it's also um, well informed by my experience as a graphic designer. And so you might actually see some tools from the world of design in this workshop that maybe uh, you wouldn't see in most other um, AI workshop pipelines. Uh, so Warren, uh, this is not a workshop about text to image, so you won't find any Dolly, Mid Journey, or Stable Diffusion here. Um, I think that those tools are great, but um, Part of my you know, interest and excitement as an artist is in curating my own data sets. Um, Jen Carson, I believe, is here, maybe teaching workshops right now. Um, but she, her uh, Instagram handle is actually own your data set. And I think that we um, share some, some enthusiasm, actually, for the laborious, um, sometimes tedious, but deeply meditative process of, of curating, collecting your own data um, to make your own AI models. Uh, so if you missed the morning talk, um, this is just a, a brief uh, refresher on the idea of generative adversarial networks. So you have two neural networks in conversation with one another, a generator and a discriminator. Generator is generating images. Uh, the discriminator is the one that has seen the real images and is basically judging whether something is real or fake. And the two of these networks go back and forth for a long time, deciding, is this real? Is this fake? And they both get better at their jobs. So the generator gets better at generating images. The discriminator gets better at deciding what's real and what isn't. And over time, they're able to produce some really convincing images based on training data. 
So this is kind of a, a deep simplification of um, the process of training your own generative adversarial network, uh, specifically um, talking in, um, in this talk about StyleGAN, which was uh, really the way that you made AI art um, prior to the explosion of text-to-image models over the last 18 months or so. Uh, so basically the process is um, very simply to collect a bunch of data, train a model, um, but then there are some other kind of uh, secondary steps that, that might happen along the way. So you might collect a bunch of data, make adjustments to it, um, do some pre-processing transformation of that data before training a model. And then when you train that model, you might find actually that it has not created at all what you intended it to um, and that you need to refine some inclusion parameters um, and then either go back to the drawing board of collecting data or reconsider how you're processing and transforming that data. And then once you've trained your model, you might also want to um, apply some, some uh, processes or transformations to the output of that model. So to simplify, data, train, output, and then along the way, we might do some transformation, we might do some revision, and we might do some stylization. So um, to kind of keep us grounded throughout this talk, you're gonna see this diagram up in the corner, and I'm just gonna highlight where we are in the talk. Um, and also, uh, at any point, if, if people wanna um, raise a hand and interrupt, uh, feel free to ask a question, but I'm also gonna leave time for questions at the end. Um, so I hope this is useful, and also um, I think it should be possible, right, that we could share these slides afterwards so that people could access them. Cool, so we'll do that so you can re-reference when you start exploring yourself. Uh, so first, talking about the data part. Um, there might be a couple questions that we want to answer. What makes data good? Where do I find data? Uh, what about creating data? And what does it mean to ethically source data? Uh, so what makes data good when we talk about what kinds of data we want to collect for a generative adversarial network? Um, so a couple of things that I noticed in my process was shared visual motifs. So if you have a data set, um, so for example, this is a, a model that I trained off of um, uh, stock photos of raindrops on glass, which is a um, very large repository, um, I guess because of the editorial versatility of raindrops on glass. You know, it could be the, the joy of spring or it could be a dark and stormy night. It could be a melancholy look out the, out the window as we, you know, dream of being by the lake. Um, but having shared visual motifs um, in images really helps when, when you think about um, creating a model and, and um, specifically creating videos like this, which are linear interpolations between um, representations that the model has learned, uh, that if it has some kind of commonalities across images to sort of link onto, it makes it a lot easier to create these kind of nice flowing conversations between different points in high dimensional space. Whereas if you um, have a wide diversity of images when you're training a style GAN model, uh, the output videos that you create can have some really abrupt changes uh, or your model could um, experience something called mode collapse, which we'll talk about in a little bit, where it just kind of doesn't settle on, on anything because it doesn't have any consistency across the data. Um, other things that are important to consider, dynamic composition. Um, so this is you know, something to consider whether you're making AI art or um, you're painting in a studio, but thinking about the, um, the shapes that, that uh, exist in your composition, the conversations um, between colors in a composition, um, having depth, having atmospheric perspective, um, all of those things that make works of art interesting um, uh, to the to the human eye are also really useful um, for adding some some interesting visual elements to a generative adversarial network. Um, we also need to fit model constraints. Um, so you have to consider um, basically like depending on which model you're using, maybe it only uses square images, and so. Even if you're collecting landscape and portrait images, um, you may know that they're gonna be cropped later and so you want to um, consider that when you're collecting the images. 
Um, and then also alignment. So the, this was some um, training data from a, a model that I trained on my own face. Um, and the first pass had done a terrible job. Um, it was uh, very deeply disturbing, actually, what I created. Um, and so the second time, I actually had to go through and do some pre-processing in order to, um, to find my own eyes in the picture and align the eyes so that they were all in the same place. And that really helped to make it a little bit less of a horror show. <laughs> um, so where do I find data? Um, this is a great question, uh, and the answer is everywhere. Um, whether it's good data or not, we just talked about. Um, you might want to make some considerations there. Um, but here were a few resources that I found useful. Um, so uh, if you've heard the term API before, you might have heard it thrown around like a lot. And um, it's very confusing at first, but Basically, fundamentally, an API is just like a URL where you can get data. So you go to some website and um, maybe they have uh, some documentation about how their API works and um, you may have noticed this as you're browsing the internet, you'll have like a little question mark and then you'll have all of these variables and it'll say user equals and some alphanumeric string and um, you know number of clicks and number of posts and things like that. Well, you can actually use that data to communicate with a data structure on the internet and get information back. So a lot of companies will um, set up APIs, which stands for Application Programming Interface, to access data. Um, and so for some of these models that I trained on stock photographs, Pexels, and Unsplash um, are royalty-free stock photo websites that actually provide a whole bunch of documentation about how to use their API. Um, and you can download data directly from that URL. Um, Python and Beautiful Soup are also really great for scraping. Um, I really love Python as a programming language, especially as an intro spot. So if you haven't coded before, but you're kind of thinking about um, diving into it, uh, I find that it can be very accessible and very um, kind of easy to understand and experiment with. Um, and also has just an incredible wealth of libraries available for data processing and, um, and things like that. Um, Beautiful Soup, if you are a Python user, you might already know this. Um, Beautiful Soup is a library um, specifically for parsing HTML. So if you have a website that doesn't have an API um, and you want to uh, pull some data off of it, Beautiful Soup can be really useful for kind of breaking up HTML code, which decides what gets displayed on the browser, um, and actually extracting metadata that you want for your model. Um, there are also a ton of browser extensions for bulk downloads. Um, and so that can, can be another way of um, uh, a no-code way, notably, of um, getting a whole bunch of images from a website. Um, and then also database searching. So GitHub, the Internet Archive, uh, research publications, um, just have an incredible wealth of, of information um, that's really useful. Uh, what about creating data? Um, so not only can we source data, but we can also think about um, how we could bring non-digitized uh, information into a digital space in order to train our own model. So some notes um, about creating your own data. Um, one is be consistent. So I have some pictures of, of flowers here, and you can see they all have a black background. Um, if you were to introduce some pictures with a white background, then um, all of a sudden you're going to have, uh, you know, your, your model sort of trying to decide between does this have a black background or a white background, and you might have some dramatic um, shifts between those two. So um, being consistent in the way that you lay out your images or in the criteria that you use to collect or create images uh, is really important. Um, and also, you know, related to the conversation we just had about visual motifs. Uh, also, reduce overhead. So some of the best human inventions have been the result of sheer laziness. I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. Um, so as much as you can uh, reduce the amount of, of uh, time that you are wasting doing the same action over and over, um, the better. So here's just an example of a um, stamp collection where rather than scanning every single stamp on its own, um, someone has you know, tessellated these stamps onto the scanner bed, scanned one image at once, and then gone through digitally and extracted them 
uh, instead. And anyone that has used a scanner knows like one of the, the biggest you know, overhead costs there, um, if you're scanning individual stamps, there's just the sheer amount of time that it takes to go forward and go back and alignment and all of that. Um, also in creating data, consider secondary usage. Um, I put some birds up here because I don't know if anyone else um, does amateur ornithology, but um, could be an interesting opportunity to consider. You know, if you're collecting all of these images because you uh, would like to create a model that can generate images of birds, maybe there's a research arm somewhere nearby that could actually really use some more photos of birds and trees around here in Vermont or something like that. So um, maybe consider secondary usage and, and um, you know, communicate with your local community and say, hey, you know, are, are, there, are there data collections that don't exist yet that, that should exist that would also be a good opportunity for me to, to learn about you know, how to curate a data set for an AI model? Um, and then also use transformation um, as a step to clean and or increase size. Um, so I'll go over that a little bit more in a bit. Um, what does it mean to ethically source data? This is a big conversation, um, and I don't think that it has been a decided conversation yet. There's a lot of voices, a lot of conversation about this. Um, and I really think that it could be a great opportunity here today for people to also talk through sort of what their feelings are on, on ethically sourcing data. And um, I think it's a, it's a very important conversation also related to labor and compensation. Um, so we really can't have these conversations about, about data um, or about authorship or about credit without also necessarily, unfortunately, talking about um, talking about economics and talking about capitalism and talking about labor and, and compensation and things like that. So um, that's a, um, there are a lot of really good resources out there. Um, here were just a couple kind of notes that I've come across um, in my research. Um, so for extra reading, there's a um, zine called Making AI Art Responsibly uh, from the Partnership on AI, which talks all about um, the data set, the model code, training resources, and publishing. Um, some other notes of my own that I had were um, to consider the compute strain and financial costs. So there's something called DDoSing, which is direct denial of service attack. Um, it can be done intentionally. Say you want to take down a website by just flooding it with too many requests. Um, and that's you know, something that we see often in like hacker movies. But oftentimes, uh, websites also get DDoSed entirely by accident. Um, so if some new product comes out or um, some new health portal opens and everyone goes to sign up all at once, that can also be um, a distributed denial of service attack kind of unintentionally that can take down servers. And so um, when we think about uh, collecting images, you also have to be cognizant of the fact that especially when um, images are coming from a place, say it's an academic institute that has shared these images because they want them to be publicly accessible, but they were thinking about it in terms of a user downloading maybe one or two images every five minutes, and you've gone and scripted to download their entire website in a matter of seconds, that could potentially put a lot of strain on their computational resources, could cost them a lot of money. Um, so there are ways to kind of go about that either by contacting or by um, planning your scripts to scrape um, in a slower manner that can consider that compute strain financial cost. Uh, another uh, consideration is what is the provenance of the data? So. Um, Maybe you want to um, train a model to generate medical images because it would be really cool to have you know, animations of brains changing um, kind of all over the place and um, you know, it would look great for your music video. But um, maybe like what is the provenance of that data? Because if you are just looking on the website for x-rays and MRIs uh, and you're checking GitHub repositories and you're um, using all of these image search um, things, you may find that actually there's sensitive personal health information in that data. And maybe it was uploaded to the website unintentionally. And so um, really thinking through what the provenance of the data is, how it got to where it was, if it's supposed to be there um, is important. Um, also assessing data set diversity. 
So um, for anyone that's familiar with Sophia Crespo's work, she's an AI artist who does some really incredible stuff with um, jellyfish in particular is one series of hers that I really love. Um, and she gave a talk at um, MIT Future Sketches a couple weeks ago where she talked about a frustration that they had when they were collecting training data for that model is that the only pictures of jellyfish on the internet are really adult jellyfish. And I had no idea, but jellyfish go through like six or seven different stages in their life cycle. And so she noticed in her model that they were actually only representing one of those life stages in, in the model. Um, and that you know it could pot potentially do um, a disservice to understanding of jellyfish life cycles everywhere. Um, now that's kind of a, a fun natural science example of that, but um, there are also you know, more serious considerations to be made when we talk about uh, data sets that use humans and um, diversity there because we um, know that um, statistically speaking, some data sets or some, some models can actually um, not only replicate biases but exacerbate them. So you might have a data set that is 60% one demographic and 40% another and a model could learn representation and latent space that produces 80% that demographic and 20% of the underrepresented demographic. Um, so another consideration to make. Uh, and then finally, what is the destination? Like, where is it going? What are you creating with this? Um, what's the purpose of it? How will people interpret it? Um, who's going to see it? Uh, how will that make them feel? Those are all important questions, too. So what kinds of transformations might I want or need to apply? Um, those could include things like cleaning, filtering, stylization, um, or artificial data set size inflation. So I mentioned before it can be very laborious to collect all of these images. Um, and yeah, I'll get to that in a second. Um, so in terms of cleaning, um, uh, as I go through this talk, you might also see like in the bottom left corner here some like icons of um, software websites and things like that. Those are just references for later um, if you're like curious of, of ways in which you can do some of the suggestions here um, that I found useful in my process. So one of the first things um, in the cleaning step is to remove duplicates. So there was this really um, awesome paper, which I've linked here, um, that came out, I think, in November or December of last year, um, talking about memorization. So something um, that was a really common response uh, to critiques about um, data sets and transformative use was that, oh, um, these generative models are never actually learning or never actually replicating their training data. They are always creating some collage or they're always um, blending things together or it's a you know, representation of, um, of a probability distribution. But uh, something that this paper found um, and a number of others actually is the idea of memorization. So this can happen when you have duplicates in your training data, especially a lot of duplicates. You see um, Mrs. Doubtfire here and Garfunkel and Oates. It's a comedy duo. Um, images that show up a lot on, on the internet can oftentimes kind of poison a data set and, um, and end up being memorized exactly. So on the top row here, you see the original image. And on the bottom row, you actually see the generated image um, and you can see that they are almost pixel perfect um, representations of the training data. So that's a good reason to make sure when you're collecting your own training data to go through and remove duplicates. And that could be an automated process that might also involve some manual checking. Uh, another step is to delete low resolution images. Um, so, uh, you know, here's a high resolution image, here's a low resolution image. Um, low res images can cause some really bizarre artifacts um, in uh, GAN models, and um, maybe that's what you want to do, um, but oftentimes it's not. 
uh, I've, I ran into one issue where I wanted to create a model that would generate fire, and I found this really great um, data set uh, for computer vision for fire detection in kitchens. So they were deploying it in um, fast food context to detect when something was on fire in a fast food restaurant. Um, but it turns out that detecting fire from an image actually doesn't really require super high resolution images and that it's much easier to um, train and share these models if they're operating on a lower scale. So using that, that training data as my fire image just created this model that like fundamentally was just creating like big blocks of pixels that were vaguely red and gray. <laughs> um, another consideration is to be careful with file types. Uh, so um, like StyleGAN, for example, uh, I think they fixed this in StyleGAN 3, but I think in StyleGAN 2 it was an issue. Um, it would ingest PNGs that had an alpha like transparent pixels, um, but then it would end up sometimes breaking the model, but sometimes it wouldn't be until it had like gotten to that image. So you might be um, training for a really long time before that one thing kind of clogged your pipe and burst your whole system. Um, and so it's important when you're you know, walking through transformation to think about cleaning data. Um, maybe you just wanna add a white background to things that are transparent. Um, and then also in cropping. Um, so I, I trained another model where I was using um, uh, images that were just a straight shot down a road. Um, and it was a square style GAN model. And so I just created this script to automatically crop um, right in the middle of the image. But as you can see um, on the left here, it's cropped fine because the you know, vanishing point is in the middle. Um, but on the right, because of the dramatic photographic composition, we actually have the vanishing point is not contained within the crop square. Um, and so that necessitated actually going back and finding a way to identify the vanishing point in the image before cropping. Uh, filtering is also really useful. Um, so that could be manual filtering, but that could also be things like, um, for example, I um, trained this other model um, using color selection. So the first version of the model that I had trained, um, I found that it was um, uh, and uh, like a mixture of a lot of different colors. And what I actually wanted to access was just the landscapes in the training data. And so as a proxy for that, I um, basically used um, k-means pixel clustering um, and set some arbitrary number. I said five and I said, okay, find me the five kind of centroids of uh, color that are represented in this image using hue, saturation, and, and uh, lightness. And so um, from there, I was able to pick, to pick out which colors were most prominent in the image and then filter to a specific hue range. So I said, only give me things that are somewhere between slate blue and lime green because I want images that are um, you know, skies and ocean and trees. Uh, metadata analysis is also useful. So some of those APIs that I mentioned before also include metadata, um, for example, caption information or geolocation or um, categories for tagging. So that can be a useful way of filtering. Um, and then subject detection or image segmentation. So um, a lot of these are, are used for computer vision, for um, selecting a specific object, but can also be really useful for filtering. So you can say, I only want pictures of cats and not pictures of dogs. And there are a lot of libraries that exist out there for subject detection and, um, uh, that can segment images. Um, also in terms of transformation, stylization can be really useful, um, both for editing and also for um, data set size inflation. So um, there are models out there that can do time of day or seasonal translation. So if you only want landscape images that are in the winter time, uh, there are actually AI models that can convert your summer images to winter images, um, or that can convert your daytime images to sunsets or your nighttime images to daytime. Um, so that can be another way of transforming your data to, to kind of steer your model in a different direction without even beginning the training process. 
Um, another one is style transfer or image filters. Um, so maybe you want a very painterly model, but you want it to be of a specific kind of architecture and you don't have enough uh, paintings of this particular architecture that you want. And so um, you might want to apply something like style transfer to uh, you know, say, give me this architectural style in the, um, or this architectural style in the style of Picasso um, and use that as your training data. Uh, another one is alignment. I mentioned that face model before where I was trying to get my eyes in the same place. Um, another model that I created that was the stuff of nightmares was a hand model that used left and right hands and so there was just a lot of like this happening. Um, and so uh, the second time that I worked on that model I set it up to um, use metadata to identify whether it was a left or right hand and then I flipped all of the hands so um, it would still oscillate between whether it was your palm side or the back of your hand side but at least the fingers were in the same location. So it was a little bit more of a subtle undulation into the uncanny. Um, and then finally, um, background removal. So I, I trained another model that was, um, uh, it was a model model. Uh, so it was using fashion models and um, removing the backgrounds of those images um, in order to really just focus on, on the, the main subject. Um, and I, I also did that using um, subject detection, uh, which I mentioned on the previous slide. Uh, so another transformation that we might need or want to apply is artificial data set size inflation. So um, you need a lot of images to train these models. Um, so generative composition was one that I really uh, enjoyed. Um, what we see up in the left corner here uh, was I was I wanted to create this model that could replicate potted plants and that would actually um, you know interpolate between a cactus and an aloe tree and a fig tree and a bouquet of roses um, and I got a whole bunch of potted plants but I still didn't have enough it still wasn't quite where I needed it to be. Um, but in the process, accidentally actually, as I was removing backgrounds, some of my plants were in white pots. And the background removal process took the pots away when it took the background away. So I had all of these poor plants that had no pots anymore. But then this idea occurred to me that actually it was wonderful because I had all of these plants and I could get pictures of pots that didn't have plants in them and I created these plant pot adjacency matrices. So I basically had a, a row of pots and then a column of plants and then um, digitally potted them in Adobe Illustrator uh, such that um, you had all of these different permutations of, um, you know, a cactus in a high blue pot and an aloe plant in a low um, terracotta pot. And it was a great way of increasing my data set size, um, not linearly, but actually from n to n squared uh, very quickly. Um, also, rotation and mirroring can be really helpful, um, especially, you know, this only works actually for data sets where rotation and mirroring doesn't matter. Um, but you can see here um, for my, my maps model, because um, I was taking these maps out of context, uh, I actually made a Twitter bot to tweet the training data. So if you ever want to check out maps out of context on Twitter, it's like sharing those. But um, uh, yeah, I decided that I didn't actually care about orientation. North, south doesn't really matter for the model that I was trying to um, create because it was just more of the, uh, the feel and the colors of the maps that were in the training data. Um, that, that that would be um, a sufficient way to increase the training data size. Uh, you can also use generated images as inputs. Um, so almost using your own kind of evolutionary process. So this was actually a, a model that I trained on um, microscopy images and biology images. Um, and I was particularly excited by um, two different types of images that I saw a lot in the generative um, outputs. One was this kind of mycelial um, uh, texture. So there were these like um, wispy kind of tendrils like uh, coming off of mushrooms almost that I really liked in the data. Um, and then another was this more sort of like goopy vacuole like cellular matrix type composition. So 
from the, um, the output images, I kind of collected new training data that I wanted to um, use and transform and duplicate in a new model. Um, and then also cropping. So this was also from that map model that I worked on. Um, these images are huge, so it's actually the opposite of the resolution problem I talked about before. These images are like 72,000 pixels wide sometimes, um, but you can actually get some um, really high fidelity images by cropping to a much smaller size. So from a single uh, image that's downloaded from the repository, you might get six or seven or eight smaller compositions. Um, I'm going to pause here for a second. Any questions so far? Yeah, that's a great question. So I'll repeat for the, the cameras. Um, so the question was, how many of these tools that I'm using in data collection and transformation already existed in my toolkit, and how many did I have to learn afresh? Um, and it's funny because now that I think about it, the line starts to blur where I don't really remember at which point I learned different tools. Um, but I'll just go through some of them quickly. Um, processing was actually how I learned to code. Um, because it was the first time that I had a code representation that also allowed me to interact with variables and change them. And even if I didn't fully understand what everything was doing, I knew that if I changed this number, it went from red to blue. And that was helpful. Um, Adobe Illustrator I had used a ton in my design work, um, but I really like it was actually probably the tool that was most like readily accessible to me because it was so familiar. Like I'm sure that there are um, other cropping tools that are people are used to using in their daily life. Like you know Mac Preview, you can just Control K in order to crop out an area. So maybe that would be the fastest for someone else. Um, I found that Illustrator was nice because you could do multiple crops at the same time using artboards and then just export. Um, Bash scripting was something that um, I really learned purely out of frustration and need to automate things. Um, maybe laziness was um, where I just, you know, I, I needed to sort images really quickly or I needed to rename files quickly. Um, and every time that I Googled how to do that, the internet kept telling me I needed to open my command line. And finally I was like, okay, I guess I'm going to learn the command line. <laughs> um, uh, Adobe Lightroom was something that um, I hadn't used previous to doing this work, but I had a lot of friends who were photographers who recommended it for kind of applying bulk uh, light changes. Um, GitHub repositories I was familiar with. Runway ML um, was kind of my intro into AI before I started doing any coding related to it because it's a totally uh, code-free, what you see is what you get type system. Uh, collab notebooks um, was also something that I was kind of pushed into by necessity um, and peers on the internet being like, you can just do so much with it. It's worth you know figuring out how to struggle through the, the complexity of the system um, in a really great way to access other community notebooks and chunks of code and things like that. Um, and then Photoshop I had used for forever and I had no idea about batch actions. So Photoshop batch actions are like you can basically record yourself doing something like cropping or applying a filter or something like that. Um, and then you can save that recording of whatever you did and replay it on a whole file system, on a whole you know, set of folders and automate a whole bunch of stuff. So um, that was something where it was a, a familiar technology but like a totally new application of it. Um, so in terms of training, um, lots of questions. How do I train a model? How do I choose which model? How much does it cost to train a model? How do I troubleshoot? Um, these are scary questions, especially if you're like just first diving into um, AI and generative technologies. Um, but there are also questions that um, I think the answers to them are evolving so rapidly that probably what I added here three days ago is already maybe a little out of date. Um, and I think one of the, the challenges here is um, 
is more about like how to find resources. So I'll go through kind of what I know, but with the caveat that like there's so much out there to stay on top of that like I can't possibly touch all of it. And I really encourage people to think about what they want to create and really go searching for communities that have um, tools that support that specific type of visual representation or data structure or something like that. Um, so some tools for training a model, um, Runway ML, as I mentioned, was kind of the first way that I dove into this. Um, it's a no-code machine learning lab. You can do all kinds of fun stuff with it. You can train your own style GAN models. You can um, apply style transfer, which is what I showed before, like applying Picasso to a new architectural style. Um, Google Collab is Python on Google GPUs, so um, you know you have access to high performance computing type stuff, um, but then you also have the ability to work in a familiar format. If you've done Python programming before, um, you might be used to the Jupyter notebook structure where you like run a cell of code and then you have some small output and it's a very nice way of, of um, debugging and also sharing your code. Uh, Replicate, I only recently learned about, but this is APIs and cloud compute for community models. So this is like basically a wrapper for um, different uh, model code um, and allows you to uh, use their infrastructure, but then also um, uh, kind of be more customizable with your uh, workflow pipelines. Um, and then there's all kinds of custom setups um, using, you know, PyTorch and Jupyter Notebooks and AWS. Um, you could also try to kill your laptop. I know lots of people that have trained their own style GAN models on a laptop computer and it can take, you know, a month. <laughs> um, but power to them. You know, some people, it's, it's more about, about the process and the struggle and the labor that's involved um, than necessarily efficiency. So, um, Whatever, whatever floats your boat, depending on what your um, you know, objectives are and your needs for customizability. Um, how do I choose which model? This really depends um, a lot on what you want to do and what's out there because there's new things coming out all the time. Um, I really love survey papers and research. Um, so survey papers are just um, academic papers that are kind of meta. So rather than introducing a new technology or a new model, they basically look at you know what is the state of the art today and how what are the affordances and drawbacks of each of these things. Um, so uh, when I share these slides, you can look at, at this one in particular um, has a great kind of look at all of these generative adversarial networks and says, you know, some are data efficient and some of them are good for conditioning and, um, you know, some have uh, different features of them in terms of the way that they're structured. Um, also consider your subject matter. So um, I'll talk about transfer learning in a, in a little bit, um, but basically like some models when they come um, pre-trained on certain data sets. Um, for example, StyleGAN2, one of the data sets that was pre-trained on was FFHQ, which is the Flickr faces data set. So um, that pre-trained model in particular does really well with faces. So if you want to um, generate new faces, even if they're um, of a different style or a different um, uh, different subject matter, that might be a good place to start. So thinking about what the original training data was and how much that um, is different than what you're trying to do. Um, also, what parameters are priorities? So um, a friend of mine, Mikhail Alafritz, designed uh, Lucid Sonic Dreams, which is a um, notebook, um, and I think now also is available through the Replicate API for um, basically creating a uh, latent walk, those animations um, using audio also. Um, so if you wanted to create a music video and you wanted to have sliders that could adjust based on the um, pitch or the um, drum beat of your music, then um, you would really want to look at a very small subset that can work with um, parameters related to audio. Um, and then also try a lot, like experiment, um, the worst that can happen is that uh, you waste a bunch of time, <laughs> um, but I think it's it's a really fun space to explore, um, and you may be actually surprised with the way that models respond to the inputs that you give them. Um, how how close are we, Chris? Uh, we're a little over, but it's still 
Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, I will share these slides afterwards so that they can be used afterwards. Um, but I, you know, there's always going to be uh, trade-offs in terms of cheap, easy, customizable. It's kind of like pick two of three. Um, and so you sort of have to decide what your priorities are there. Um, and then for troubleshooting, definitely rely a lot on community resources like forums and chats. Visualize your data as a debugging process and also consider approaching from a different angle. So, you know, there could be multiple ways to look at the same problem. Um, you may need to revise training data. Um, so you might have unexpected results, um, mode collapse, as I mentioned before, or you might want to just move in a new direction, um, or you may have missed a cleaning step. Um, transfer learning is a great way to take a model that already exists and um, kind of move to in a different direction um, without wasting a whole bunch of time and compute resources to do so. Um, and then once you've trained, you might want to do some stylization. So that could involve things like applying style transfer to outputs, um, cropping, outpainting, um, chroma keying. So chroma keying is just green screening. This was that fashion model that I mentioned before, where I wanted it, the output video to also have a transparent background. So I actually put a green screen in and then removed it in post-process. Um, or also thinking about framing and collage, things like that. Um, there's such a thing called ESR GAN, which is a GAN that specifically has learned to upscale things. So you actually can now enhance using the computer like they do in sci-fi movies. Um, lots of resources, code and no code for doing that. Um, and as I mentioned before, Photoshop batch actions are really great for bulk changes. Um, on Macs, Automator is also good for bulk image processing um, or, you know, scripting file names, that sort of thing. Um, but there's also lots of resources that are code based. Those were just two I wanted to share that are no code. Uh, and then in terms of output, um, we've seen a lot of presentations from artists on, you know, different ways to output images. Um, so just a couple that, that I've been enjoying, projection mapping, video collage, 3D objects, sculpture, once again, please stop by BCA if you haven't seen the exhibit yet, um, and textiles is something else that I've been working a lot with. So I'll stop there, I realize I'm over time, sorry about that, but um, uh, feel free to come up and chat with me afterwards if you have more questions.